So the name of the, the title of the sermon tonight is First Things First. First Things First. And I felt like this is an important topic to preach on. And I almost didn't because quite frankly, there's a lot of things that we're going to go over tonight that are very basic, very basic, simple truths that make up the Christian life. And it's something I feel like I've touched on even recently. But it's these simple things, these basic things that need to be driven home that we have to make sure we're making a part of our Christian life if we're going to succeed, if we're going to make it in the long run. And it seems like whenever things get hectic, whenever there's a big, uh, big blow up or there's a, you know, a, a, a lot of drama more than even usual, uh, people tend to get very frazzled. People tend to get very distracted. And it's always good to, at times like that to just regain our focus, look at what really matters in the Christian life and make sure that we're doing what we need to do day by day uh, if we're going to succeed and make it through these uh, tough times. So what I'm preaching about tonight is the fact that spiritual priorities must come first. Spiritual priorities in our life are what come first, and they come before physical priorities. If you notice there in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, he said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And today, so many people, they want it both ways. They want to serve God, but they also want to spend a lot of time making money. And he's saying, here, look, you can't have it that way. It's one or the other. You can't become, you know, and of course people can work hard and be diligent and, and do things right and God can bless them and they can come into wealth that way. But if we make our life all about making money, we're going to be out of balance and we're going to find ourselves serving mammon and, rather than God. He says there in verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? <clears throat> and of course we know the passage here telling us we can't add one cubit to our stature, that we, can't, uh, that we shouldn't worry about clothing and, and food and all these things. And look what he says here in verse 31. He says, Therefore take no thought what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewith you shall be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. <coughs> For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But our spiritual priorities are what need to come first in the Christian life, not our physical and people should not become overly concerned with their earthly needs. That's really what he's teaching here. Is he's saying, look, don't, don't worry so much about your food. Don't worry so much about what you're going to put on. Don't worry about all these things that the Gentiles tell you to worry about. Don't worry about making sure you have every type of insurance. Don't make sure you have an abundance of wealth in the bank. Don't make sure that you have some great retirement fund waiting for you. Now, of course, there's wisdom in that, that we should always be thinking ahead and preparing and, and be ready for that. I, I understand that there's a, a certain level of, uh, of, of preparedness that we should have financially. I get that, that we should foresee the evil that's potent that could potentially come our way and be prepared. But people today, they seem like that's all they want to do. They want to build up some great treasure here on earth so that when they retire, they'll never have to work another day in their life and they'll be just sitting on easy street. Or they want to you know, make sure that they have a ton of insurance, insurance for this, insurance for that. So if anything possibly remotely goes wrong, that they're covered. And Jesus is saying here, don't, you know, care, you know, don't get distracted by those things. Take no thought for your life, he's saying, what you shall eat. He's saying, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. And we get so worried sometimes just about what we're going to do you know, for food and raiment. And he's saying, Look, these earthly needs that we have come second to our spiritual needs. Our spiritual priorities come first. So we should not be overly concerned with earthly needs. I'm not saying be careless. I'm not saying disregard them. I'm just saying don't become overly concerned. And really, this is difficult for those who have little faith. People who really struggle with this, it's a lack of faith at the end of the day. I mean, that's, that's what he said there. He said, oh, he of, of little faith, right? Verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And that's really where people struggle. When they see, that's really where the rubber meets the road in the Christian life sometimes. When we actually get into these, these situations, these positions where we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe we're not going to have the food and clothing. Maybe we really have to start relying on God. And people struggle. And it's because they don't have the faith. If you would, go over to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I mean, this is a promise in the Word of God. That God is going to provide everything that we need. Day by day. He might not, we might not know what He's going to provide 10 years from now. But we know that if we just are faithful to Him, and we put first things first, 
that he's going to provide for us day by day. But people don't like that because that requires us having to walk by faith, having to tr actually trust the word of God, trust the promises of God. The Bible says in Psalm 37, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. That's another precious promise in the word of God. That if we're faithful, that if, we're, if we live a righteous life, God's not going to forsake us. Even if some great famine were to take over our land and the grocery stores are emptied of all their food, if we're living for God, if, we, if we're right with God, we're not going to be forsaken. I mean, you think about Elijah when he was told to go hide, in the, you know, hide out in the river. That was during a famine. And he took care of him. When that wasn't, you know, Elijah wasn't just some backslidden guy. You know, he, he sent, he was faithful and he sent him the ravens. He sent him the meat day by day and he fed him. And then he sent, when that brook dried up, he said, well, now go to the widow. And he worked miracles. I firmly, I honestly believe that if it ever came to that, if we're right with God, God will provide for us miraculously. Because that's a promise. But that requires us having to walk by faith. You know, it's easy to say that when I'm up here all fat and sassy. You know, when I just went and helped myself to some nachos and a Coke. You know, but what, if, what, what happens when the famine actually does hit? When the bank account dries up? When all the, the bags of rice are gone? And then we have to stop and, and ask ourselves, do we really believe the word of God? Do we, can we really walk by faith at that point? And the people that are probably going to have the, the hardest time with that are those that, you know, aren't right with God. But those of us that are living for the Lord, you know, keeping our sin account short, keeping, you know, our sins confessed and living for the Lord and doing what's right, living righteously, I think we can have these promises for ourselves. He said in Philippians 4, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so often we like to apply that to, you know, our, our, you know, our, our spiritual need, our emotional needs. We like to... Think about how he's going to comfort us and aid us and guide us, you know, in our, you know, in our inward man. But this applies just as much to the outward man as well. God shall supply all our needs according to his riches. And these are great promises here at Matthew 6 and Psalms and Philippians. But they all must be taken by faith. They all must be taken by faith. Our spiritual priority priorities should come before our physical priorities. <clears throat> our physical needs, let me say, say this, should, and our physical needs and wants should not make us barren spiritually. And this is what happens to people, even Christians, even well-intentioned people. They get so caught up in the physical world. They get so caught up in their jobs and their houses and their lands and their wealth and just all the physical needs of this life that it makes them barren spiritually. Become, they become focused on the physical rather than on the spiritual. And it robs them. And you know, and they might end this life very comfortable physically, but then they're going to heaven and they're going to be beggars in heaven. They're going to have no rewards. They're going to have nothing. They might have had it really good here, but if they let their physical needs take pre precedence over their spiritual needs, you know, they're going to be they're going to be wanting in heaven, unfortunately. So don't let our physical needs come before our spiritual needs. Don't let your physical priorities come before your spiritual priorities. Otherwise, your physical needs and wants will make you barren spiritually. Look there in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world. What does he mean by care? He doesn't mean, you know, this is even talking about environmentalist. You know, the caring for the world, going out and, you know, planting grass on some riverbank to prevent erosion or something or trying to eradicate some invasive species or something. No, the care of this world is what he's talking about is the worry, the care, the, the concerning ourselves with the things of this world. He said, the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. If we get too wrapped up in this world, this physical present world, we're going to become unfruitful, spiritually speaking. And you know what's going to happen is we're going to get to heaven and we're going to see the guy who maybe didn't have the biggest house and drive the newest car and have all the nicest clothes, maybe didn't take all the vacations that everybody else took, didn't get to do all the fun things that everybody did, but you know what he's going to have? If he lived for God and spent his time investing in the things of, of the Lord, is he's going to have rewards, eternal rewards, where moth and rust doth not corrupt, 
where thieves don't break through or still steal. He said in verse 33, if you, I should have had you keep something, Matthew 6. I'll just read it for you. But he said, we already read it earlier. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We're very familiar with that verse. That's a very popular verse, but I wonder how often we really apply that to our life. How often we can really step back and say, well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to seek thing, the, the kingdom of God first. I'm going to make sure I'm right with God above anything else. Before, you know, cons you know, when it comes to consideration of where I'm going to live or what job I'm going to have or how big my house is or how many kids I'm going to have or how, whatever, how I'm going to spend my time. Before I, before I decide that, I'm going to make sure that it's, I'm going to seek God's kingdom first. I'm going to put his righteousness first, and then I'm going to let him sort all these other things out for me. And it's important, I think, to be reminded of all this. And we're going to go, and this is kind of just, you know, introduction. Because we ought to have some spiritual priorities in our life. And there's some real basic things that, and it's always the most basic things that people struggle with. And so many of our problems in life and so many things, the reason that the, and the reason why we struggle with so many things in the Christian life is because we never nail down the basics. And the basics make up everything. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So I'm just starting out tonight kind of telling you about, you know, making the point that, look, your spiritual priorities are important. They come before your physical priorities. And we're living in a day-to-day -day where, you know, just, there's just all the modern distractions that we have, which just compound this, this danger of, you know, misprioritizing spiritual needs. We get things so out of whack, especially in the, this modern age. With all the entertainment, all the leisure time that we have, other, all the downtime distractions that come into our life it's a lot easier to just do that fun thing rather than actually do the hard thing or the spiritual thing. You know, I think it's in particular of, you know, social media. And I think this is something that needs to really be preached about, is social media. Regardless of the content, good or bad. You know, it, it, even, even if you're using it well and wisely and it's, it's, it's a good thing, you know, you're not, you're not using it to do bad things, it could still be, it's a huge distraction today. And it's, it's a phenomenon that I don't think a lot of us stop to think about. The fact that just overnight, we all, we all found ourselves on social media or living in a world that just operates through social media. Nobody asked for it. And all of a sudden, now we're clicking like and making emojis and everything else. And nobody asked for this. It just, it just happened. And it's completely changed society. And, and nobody really was looking for it. And that's really a, probably a whole other sermon in and of itself. But I'm just making the point right now that there's so many distractions in this modern life that we live that if we're not careful, our priorities will get out of whack. We'll get distracted. We'll get caught up with the cares of this world. <clears throat> and it'll rob us. It'll make us unbarren. So what are some spiritual priorities? Go over to Luke chapter 18. What are some spiritual priorities? You know, and this is, this is the kind of stuff that a lot of people aren't going to want to hear. Because it's not, this isn't the fun, exciting stuff that, uh, the, of the Christian life. But this is the building blocks of the Christian life. If we don't get this stuff down, we're going to suffer spiritually. <coughs> How about prayer as a spiritual priority? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. This is something I, I've always struggled in my Christian life. I, I mean, I have to make sure that I take time to make it happen. Or it's just not going to happen. And we like to think sometimes, well, you know, I just pray throughout the day. And that's true, we do. But, I, you know, we really ought to make a point of actually praying. Actually getting on our knees to make sure we're addressing God, taking some time. And I'm not saying you have to spend an entire hour, although if you want to, that's great. But we find time for so many other things in our life, so many other distractions. But we do, do we make time for prayer? And I'm telling you, it's a spiritual priority. It's not just something that, well, you take it or leave it. No, it is one of the building blocks. The foundations of the Christian life is prayer. And if we get distracted, our prayer will be lacking. Look at Luke, at Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them in this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, excuse me, neither regarded man, 
And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. <laughs> she's being a pain in his neck. You know, she's being annoying. She's being persistent. And it's a, it's a picture of prayer that we ought to go to the judge, the Lord, who... And, and bug him <laughs> for the things that we need. And not, and not that we would be a nuisance to him, but he's using this as an example. Look, even an unjust judge is going to answer the widow's prayer if, if she keeps bugging him. How much more so is God going to answer his own children? If ye that may, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give gifts unto them that ask him? <clears throat> That's the point he's making here. And he says in verse 6, and the Lord said, hear what the, uh, 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 hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry night and day unto him, day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I mean, do we not pray because we don't believe God actually hears us? I mean, if we really believe that God in heaven hears us, would we not pray? Again, it goes back to this question of faith. Oh, ye of little faith, why don't we pray? Is it a lack of faith? Or do we really believe that God in heaven hears us? And that he really answers prayer. He said in verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now that last phrase there where he says, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And you know, a lot of times we, we think about that verse, and I've always kind of interpreted it and talked to other people about it, and I feel like they had the same take on this verse, is that you know, when Jesus comes back, will he even find Christianity? But is that really what he's saying here in the context of this passage? Or is he talking about the fact that when he comes, will there be anybody praying? Will there be anybody who actually has the faith to cry out to God day and night to avenge them? Or will, will we, even the people that know the Lord, even the people that are saved, have at that point just been so, become so faithless that they don't even bother to pray anymore? <clears throat> And here's the thing. Say, well, I don't, I don't really have time for spiritual priorities. You know, I don't know when I could pray. I, I'm, so, I'm such a busy person. Look, you'd be more effective at what you do if you prayed. You'd be more effective with less time if you prayed. If you took 10, 15 more minutes in the morning, made that part of your routine to just pray to God, you know, and there's that model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. That's a great place to start. Our Father who art in heaven, give God some glory, give Him the praise. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Think about the things that are coming. You know, that'll help us straighten out our priorities real quick. If we, if we lived every day in the light of the fact that Christ is going to return, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. I mean, this is just the model prayer. We don't repeat these words, but we could use this as a prayer. You know, give us our daily bread. What do you need today from God? Did you ask him for it? What do you have need of right now? What's important to you? Did you ask God for it? Have you taken the time to make that a priority in your life? To tell God what you need. Even if it was bread. Even if it was just some physical need. I need a new pair of shoes. I need, you know, I, I need some milk for the fridge. Whatever it is. Lord, give me the strength to go out and make the money that I need to make to provide for my family. What do you have need of today? <clears throat> Are you asking God for it? You know, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Are we struggling with some sin in our life? Are we getting tired of it? Well, let me ask you, have you prayed about it? Have we taken, made it a priority to get up in the morning to ask God, deliver me from this evil today. Help me not to commit this sin today. Whatever it is. The reason why people don't get what they need, the reason why people don't get the victory over their sins is because they don't make prayer a spiritual priority in their life. <clears throat> He says in James 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. I mean, God's just in heaven with all the riches and wisdom and knowledge. and all, He's all powerful. There's nothing he can't do. And he's wanting to do it to prove himself strong on the behalf of his children. But, he, but the question is, will he find the faith? Is, is, is it just crickets up there in heaven? Or are we actually praying to the Lord and telling him what we need? Are we making prayer a spiritual priority? You say, well, if there's all these promises, why don't people pray? Why isn't prayer more of a spiritual priority pe for people? 
Well, maybe people avoid prayer because they might not like what they find when they draw nigh to God. You know, when we, start to, when we actually take the time to get quiet and pray and start to reflect on things, and start to think about things and meditate on the Word of God, you go over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. You know, you're kind of drawing nigh to God in prayer. You're stopping, you're taking time out of your day to focus on God, on the Lord. And when you do that, I think some, the reason some people avoid it, maybe, perhaps, is because they might not like what they find. They might not like what the Holy Spirit brings to their, to their remembrance. So, oh, I'd love to help you with this, but did you remember that you're still doing this, and you still have this problem, and you still haven't gotten this right? You're still harboring this, and you're still angry about that? People might not like what they find. It says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Look at verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh, draw nigh to you. Do you think it's any coincidence, the following words? Cleanse your hand, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. But drawing nigh to God can be a very humbling experience. You know, we're not just going to bring God a, a, a grocery, grocery list and just, you know, rattle off all the things we have that day, that all the things that we need that day. <laughs> what might happen is when we actually take time to get alone with the Lord, is He might, you know, I'm not saying audibly, I'm not saying, you're, you know, that voice in your head is God. That's not how it works. That's another sermon. But things might come to remembrance. He might bring things to your mind. And you know what? You might have to say, ooh, i got to cleanse my hands. You know, I have to purify my heart. I'm a little double-minded here. Maybe I need to be afflicted. Maybe I need to mourn. Maybe I need to get humbled. That's what happens when people draw nigh to God. It's a very, it can be a very humbling experience. But go through it. You know? That's, the heart is made better. It's, it's better to go through those things. <clears throat> you know, people don't pray for, either because they're faithless, they're too proud, or both. That's why people don't make prayer a spiritual priority. Or it's just laziness. Or it's all of these things. But, you know, prayer is a spiritual priority that needs to be a part of our life. It needs to be a huge part of our life. It needs to be just a staple, just something that we do without even thinking about it. Along with all the other things that we do when we get up in the morning, or at least we should be doing, right? <laughs> taking a shower, getting ready, brushing our teeth, combing our hair, blah, 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 all the things that we do, eat breakfast, whatever it is that we do. Prayer ought to be a part of that routine where we pray to the Lord. But that's not the only spiritual priority. And again, I know this isn't the most exciting sermon, but this is the stuff that's going to make or break people. That if we don't get these things nailed down, life's going to be harder than it needs to be. How about the spiritual priority of Bible reading? I mean, this is one of the things that I think is just lacking the most in, in churches today. I mean, probably, other than prayer, probably. I mean, Bible reading is just, I mean, how do you else do you explain all the false doctrine that's out there that just goes unchecked? All the false doctrine that just gets preached across pulpits Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and nobody says a thing about it. All, all the, just the, the stupid, dumb things that get said, and nobody is there. You just tell me nobody cares? Nobody ever, I mean, maybe people pipe up but why is it even getting preached in the first place? It's because the guy behind the pulpit isn't even reading his Bible like he ought to. He doesn't even understand doctrine. He's just repeating what he heard in some Bible college. <clears throat> I'm telling you, Bible reading is a spiritual priority that must be a part of our life. Go over to Matthew chapter 7. I mean, how could you live the Christian life without knowing what's expected of you? And who's going to tell you, look, I can only, I've only got your attention, hopefully, <laughs> for 45 minutes at a time. Maybe an hour and a half a week, a week if you make it to all three services. Do you really think I'm going to be able to tell you everything you need to know that week in an hour and a half? Right. Tell you how to live the Christian life? Even a year's worth of preaching? You think I, I mean, so many things have to be repeated because they, they just go right over our heads the first time we hear them. Or we didn't catch it. Whatever. That's why God's given this big book that needs to be read. Day, every single day we ought to be in this book as much as, we're, as, as, as possible. Because we need to know what's expected of us. We need to know what it takes to, li to live the Christian life. And it's all right there. But the question is, are we taking the time to actually read it? 
Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I love Jesus. Well, do you keep his commandments? Well, what are they? I don't know. Well, why not? Because I have never read it. Well, you need to read it. You need to find out what the commandments are and then do them. Otherwise, you just saying, I love Jesus, you know, doesn't, it kind of sounds empty. It kind of sounds hollow. If you really love the Lord, you're going to want to know what it is that's expected of you. And you'll read his word. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Look, you can't do them without hearing them. You can't hear them without reading them. He says, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. No, Bible reading so boring. Oh, it's such a chore. Look, it's building your house upon a rock. It's gaining wisdom and knowledge and understanding that the world does not have and cannot offer. I mean, yes, there's some things we can learn from the world, but none of it can compare to the wisdom that's found in this book. Amen. This book will tell you how to live your life. And then when you, so that when you come to the end of it, you won't, you'll have very few regrets and have a, a great deal of blessings along the way. It won't all be easy. I mean, he says, look, he looks there. He says in verse 25, the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew. Both of these guys that built the house here in this passage, they both suffered the same storm. The question is, do you want to go through the storms of life with the wisdom of God or not? Do you want to take the world's way and try to do things the way the world does it and have your house just fall apart? Have, this, have it fall and have it be a great fall? Great was the fall of it? Or do you want to just take the time to read the Word of God line upon line, precept upon precept, hear, hear little, there little, and find out what God actually expects of us, implement it in our life, make it a part of our life, and build our house upon a rock. So when that same storm comes, that's coming regardless of whether you're prepared or not. The storms of life that come to all of us. So that when it comes, your house stands. You're not just going to fall apart into a thousand pieces. <clears throat> you got to make Bible reading a spiritual priority in your life. Because you can't, you can't do what's expected of you if you don't know. You can't do what you don't know. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Well, did you read it? Well, no. Well, then no wonder you didn't know. And you can't just rely on the preacher to tell you everything. You've got to get in there and find out for yourself. You know, and you've got to get in there and be reminded and re over and over again of these things. <clears throat> it's kind of like a guy, you know, this is something I have a lot of experience with, being a dad, you know, assembling children's furniture. You know, and you know what I learned real quick in our first child is read the instructions. <laughs> you know, be one of these guys, is, I don't need that. It's just a crib. What could possibly go wrong? You know, well, first of all, you should have read page one where it says build the crib inside the room you intend to use it. <laughs> because it won't fit through the door. And I learned that the hard way. But if I had just read the instructions, I would have known. I would have, they thought of something that I didn't think about. I'm all proud of myself, you know, after I get this crib built and it's like, Oh, take half of it apart and then put it back in the room. <coughs> read the instructions, right? When it, read, the, read the instructions for your life or it's going to get assembled wrong. You're going to end up at the end of your life with these extra pieces. You know, well, what do these go to? I don't know. And then something, there's going to be some weakness in that, that structure. You know, people, they don't make Bible reading a priority for the same reason they don't pray. These priorities all go by the wayside for the same reasons. And if you would, go to Deuteronomy chapter 17. I guess I should say this. If you fail to make Bible reading a priority, you will end up a proud person. It's just a fact. You show me a proud man, you show me an arrogant person, and I'll show you a person who doesn't read their Bible. You show me some loud mouth blow hard and I'll show you a guy who doesn't read his Bible. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 18. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of the witches before the priests and the, Le the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all his words all the words of this law and these statutes to do them that his heart 
be not lifted up above his brethren. Look, reading your Bible will make you a humble person. We'll read things in the Bible and it'll convict us. We'll read about some character who got into some sin or had some kind of an attitude and go, whoa, that reminds me a lot of myself. I need to fix that. Or it'll, we'll read the Bible and we'll realize that you know, not, nobody's perfect, that everybody has flaws. We'll read the Bible and we'll, we'll, we'll read about having to forgive and, and, and forget and, and letting people live things down. And not to, to exact, you know, we'll read all these things and we'll become humble people. And you show me the proud man and I'll show you a guy who doesn't read his Bible. You show me the guy who has no fear of the Lord. Show me a guy who's just willing to just, you know, just go out there and, and, and uh, you know, attack the man of God. And that's another sermon that needs to get preached. The man is not just afraid to just rail on God's people, rail on God's man. And attack people. And I'll show you a guy who doesn't read his Bible, guaranteed. Because this is why God told the kings to read the Bible. He said, Let him, let him, you know, he shall keep it with him all the days, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Why? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Those are the two reasons that God gave there. And that he turned not aside from the commandment. <clears throat> That's why Bible reading ought to be a priority in our life. Unless you want to end up proud people who have no fear of God. You showed me proud, vengeful people who claim to be Christians. I'll show you Christians who don't read the Bible. Period. So what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about the fact that we have to have spiritual priorities in our life. They have to be there. They have to come before physical priorities, which are also very important. But these have to be there. Prayer, Bible reading, these are just basic things. But these are the things that people struggle with the most. How about this spiritual priority? Church. Church. Is church really a priority? It should be. Absolutely. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5. I mean, it was a priority for Jesus. I'd say if the Lord made the church important, we probably should too. It's pretty important to Him. <clears throat> he said in Luke 4, 4, and you're going to Ephesians 5, and He came to Nazareth where He had been brought up, and as His custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. That was His custom. Then on the Sabbath day, He went to church. He went into the synagogue and He read. He was there for the preaching. It was a priority to him. It says that was his custom, as his custom was. It was a priority for Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Sounds to me like church is a priority to the Lord when he's giving himself for it, when he's laying down his life and purchasing the church with his own blood. You better believe it's important. Look at verse uh, 27. That he might present him to himself a glorious church having not, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It's an important thing. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. <coughs> Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. How are we going to glorify? How is God going to be glorified throughout all ages, world without end? In the church. Through the church. That's how he's going to be glorified forever. Is through the church, the congregation of the believers. That's our, what's going to bring God glory. I'd say that's important. I'd say we should probably make that a priority in our life. I mean, whatever it is we have to do, reschedule our, you know, move our schedule around. I would even tell people, change, get a different job. If I had a church, or if I had a job that kept me out of church, you know what I'd do? I'd go get a different job. Say, well, you're the deacon. You know what? I've been the deacon for a year and a half. I've been a Christian a lot longer than that. And don't think I haven't quit jobs for church or turned jobs down for church or got jobs and said, I don't, I, I, I don't work on Sundays and not get hired. I made it a spiritual priority because it was important. I mean, I'm reading my Bible here. Look, sounds like it's pretty important to God. 
And I think people should be willing even to change jobs if necessary for church. Because our spiritual needs come before our physical. We should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And people get all worried. Well, if I switch jobs, you know, it's, what's going to happen? Well, why don't you just trust God? Why don't you have a little bit of faith and just trust God and see what happens when you put him first? He says, all these things shall be added unto you. And probably even more so. <clears throat> and it was a priority for Jesus. And it, should be a, it was a priority for the first believers. Look it over at Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. <clears throat> I'll begin reading in verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people... And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when he had preached the gospel to that city and taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And look, he wasn't on just a pleasure cruise. He wasn't sightseeing. He was, in verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we through much tribulation must enter into the kingdom of God and when they had ordained elder, them elders in every church. Where is he going when he goes to all these places? He's going to churches. He's ordaining elders. I mean, he's getting stoned one day and then picking himself up, dusting himself up, and the next day going on, well, let's go visit the churches. Let's go ordain elders. Let's continue, tell people to continue in the faith. I mean, it was a priority for him. And it says in verse 24, And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And thence sailed to Antioch. And from thence uh, they, had, they had been recommended the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. I mean, just going everywhere. Establishing churches. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of, the fa of faith unto the Gentiles. And there he abode long time with the disciples. I mean, church should be a priority in our life. We need to make it one. I think it should even dictate where we live. I'll be perfectly honest about it. I mean, it did for me. I mean, when things went bad in my old church, I said, well, it's time to go. We got to leave. I said, well, there's a church, you know, an hour, whatever, halfway. And it, it would have been okay. We could have done it. But, you know, we were also in northern Michigan. And if you've ever been in the winter, it was, it was kind of, we saw it as kind of a window of opportunity. You know, get in a great church, like Faithful Word, get out of the snow once and for all, get a fresh start out in Phoenix, leave all this old life behind, all the baggage and the memories and everything that goes along with it. Just leave that all behind and go start afresh. But we didn't just go wherever we wanted. We didn't just pick a spot on the map and say, well, you know, such and such place. They got nice weather there. I mean, they got nice weather here most of the time. Today was a little bit, <laughs> makes you wonder why we live here in that heat. <coughs> But we didn't just go anywhere. You know, we chose a place that had a good, we knew the church was good, that the preaching was solid, that they were doing the work of the Lord. And that was a priority for us. And I think people ought to do that. Or they should make the best of it where they are. I'm not saying they have to do that, but they, wherever they are, they should get in church. Look, there's people out there that aren't even willing to move a half hour one direction to, make it to get closer to church. They, they, they'll, they'll complain, oh, that church is an hour away. Why don't you just move a half hour? <laughs> well, that church is two hours away. Well, why don't you just get closer? Or why don't you just make the drive? Why don't you just make church priority? You know why they don't? Because it's not. To them, it's not a priority. And I'm telling you, they're going to suffer for it. Look, being in church is important. You know, cause, and here's the thing. You know, church just isn't some social gathering. I mean, it is. It's great that we get together, we socialize and talk and have friendships. But look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'll begin reading in verse 22. He said, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, a congregation, right? And the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Look, we're not just getting together with a bunch of just people that, you know, make us feel good. People that we like to just talk to. 
with friends. Now, I get it. We're friends. That's great. That should be there. But when we're gathering together in church, you're gathering together with people whose names are written in heaven. People that you're going to spend all eternity with. The church of the firstborn. It's important. Amen. Where else are you going to find that? At work? Probably not, unless you got a brother there or a sister. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it in the, in the public schools. You're not going to find it in some dance hall. You're not going to find it in some bar or some club. You're not going to find the firstborn there. At least you shouldn't. You're not going to make that kind of relationship in a casino. You're not going to make it anywhere. You're not going to make it, you know, in some club or some little league or some, you know, whatever. Whatever worldly thing, sinful or not, you're not going to be gathering together with people whose names are written in heaven with the church of the firstborn. Where are you going to do that? You're going to do it here. You're going to do it in God's house. So don't take it for granted. It's not just a social gathering. It's important. It was a priority for the early church. It was a priority for Paul. It was a priority for the Lord himself to lay down his life for the church. And yet people, Christians, still struggle with getting their carcass in church. And look, you know, I, I, I appreciate everyone's here, but is it really that hard to get to church? Is, are you guys struggling out there right now? To is that chair like just straining to keep you held up right now? Is it... Are you, are you feel, is it difficult to just sit there and, and at least feign like you're paying attention? Probably not. I sat out there for a long time. You know, it's, it, that's the hard, you know, I'm doing the work tonight. <laughs> Can you just show up? Can you just make it a priority to hear the preaching of the Word of God? And I know I'm preaching the choir right now, but we should keep that in mind going forward. Right. Don't take it for granted. Right. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. People get in the habit of, of not making church priority and, it, and, and they suffer for it. What's another spiritual priority? The spiritual priority of prayer, the spiritual priority of Bible reading, the spiritual priority of going to church. How about the spiritual priority of soul winning? This needs to be a priority. Go over to, uh, go over to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. Look, I, I get it. You know, there's a lot of other things that we have to take care of in this life. We have school. We have work. We have families. We have all these other things, these obligations that we have to attend to in life. But we should make soul winning a priority in our life. I mean, really, it should be our life's work. Everything else is just kind of there because it has to be. But soul winning should be something that we're passionate about, something that we're dedicated to, something that moves us. It should be a priority. Because what is soul winning? Is it just knocking on a door? I mean, yeah, that's part of it, right? Knocking on the door, talking to the person. But what are you trying to do when you're soul winning? You're trying to save somebody from hell. I mean, tell me what's more important than that. Name one thing in life that's more important than saving somebody from hell. I can't think of anything. I mean, it ought to be a priority. I'm not saying we have to be out there every single day, eight, 24 hours a day. But I'm saying we should at least, can we carve out an hour? And again, I know I'm preaching the choir tonight. But can we carve out an hour of our time to go out and go soul winning once a week at the minimum? To save somebody from hell? You know, we shouldn't lose our first love. And I'm, you know, we'll skip Revelation chapter 2 just for the sake of time here. But again, you know, if we love Christ... You know, we're going to share his burden. And he had a burden for the lost. If we love the things of the Lord, and we love the Lord, we're going to love the things of the Lord. If we're, going to, if we're going to love God, if we say we're going to love God, we're going to make things a priority that he made a priority. He made church a priority. He made the word of God a priority. And he made souls a priority in his life. He said in Luke 19, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he said he was here for. He came to seek and save sinners. He said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He said, that's why I even came. That's why I left heaven and came down here and, 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 and you know, condescended to men of low estate and took on the form of a servant. That's why I humbled myself to the death of the cross is to save sinners, to call sinners to repentance. And the Lord said, he said, go out in the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. I mean, just so many scriptures about it. <clears throat> and of course, 
you know, Mark 16, which is, you know, a very familiar verse. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That was a priority to him. That's why he came here. But is it a priority for us tonight? If it is, are we going to make sure we keep it a priority for us for the rest of our lives? Or is it something that maybe we'll just get bored with? Is it just something we're doing as a hobby, just something to pass the time? Or is it our life's work? Is it a priority to us? Look, there's a lot. These are just, you know, and I, here's, a, I've said this before. I, I really don't think there's a lot to the Christian life other than these things. These things are probably very important things. And I understand, of course, there's other things to the Christian life, of course. But by and large, you know, this is the yoke that Jesus asks, asks us to put on. This is, this is what he wants to take on. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And this is not a heavy yoke. I mean, it's, all, it's a priority, but at the end of the day, really, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to pray. It's a privilege to be able to read your Bible. It's a privilege to be able to come to church. It's a privilege to be able to go out and save a soul. But they are also priorities. <laughs> and there's a lot of things in this life, there's a lot of things in this world that can take the place of spiritual priorities, that can distract us, that can pull us away, that can cause us to lose our focus on what really matters in this life. So that's why we need to learn what our spiritual priorities are and to put them first. We need to learn to put first things first. Let's go ahead and pray.